Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us tonight for episode six of our webinar series. I'm Dr. Samantha Oakes, Director of Research Investment at the National Breast Cancer Foundation. I recently joined the National Breast Cancer Foundation after previously working at the Garvin Institute of Medical Research in Sydney and also at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne. And I've been a previously National Breast Cancer funded researcher for many years. Many of you are joining us as members of the National Breast Cancer Foundation community. And for anyone who missed previous episodes, our Towards Zero webinar series is a way of keeping you connected with our researchers, hearing firsthand about their projects, latest developments, and, sorry, um, and exciting breakthroughs, all from the comfort of your own home. Today, we are going to be hearing from National Breast Cancer Foundation funded researcher, Professor Bogda Koswara, a medical oncologist and senior staff specialist from the Flinders University, who will talk about improving management of cardiovascular issues for people experiencing or recovering from breast cancer. It gives me great pleasure to hand you over to Professor Koswara. Thank you very much, Samantha. It's great to be here. Welcome, everyone. I really appreciate you taking the time to join me and um, in my study in sunny Adelaide. And I am thrilled to share with you some of the results of our work on cardiovascular disease in, and cancer. So what I might do is share the screen and show you some of the slides that will provide a bit of a background to uh, the story I'm trying to present to you. So just bear with me as I work out the technology. I need to go into the slideshow and I think we're ready to go. So I'd like to take you on a tour of issues relating to cardiovascular disease and cancer. And uh, the title that I gave uh, this presentation is the double jeopardy because I remember one day when I was talking to a person who had a history of breast cancer, who looked at me uh, when I uh, outlined of what research I was involved with and said, it's bad enough to have cancer. Why would I need to worry about cardiovascular disease? And it suddenly occurred to me that in studying cardiovascular disease after cancer, I'm really magnifying the risks that, that people who had cancer diagnosis may worry about. So what I'd like to do is present you some data and most importantly, present you with some of the things that you could do to reduce that risk. And also finish off with some suggestions of how this is not just a problem, but potentially a very exciting solution to some of the challenges of treating cancer itself. But I should really start by explaining of why it is a that the breast cancer researcher like me, after all, I'm a medical oncologist treating patients with breast cancer, would study heart disease. And the explanation is here. As a medical oncologist, I have uh, in, got involved in, in studying care of cancer survivors. As many of you would know, outcomes for breast cancer in particular are very, very good. So overwhelming majority of my patients would survive cancer and live uh, their life cancer free, but they would also notice that they might have some other concerns. And this table here summarizes of what researchers identify as common concerns for cancer survivors in Australia. This is the paper from Melbourne. And when you ask cancer survivors here, not just people with breast cancer, but other cancers as well, you would notice that there are a lot of concerns that are mostly psychosocial, if you look at the second column, but also relates to things like supportive care. And for many, many years, uh, survivorship care after cancer focused on these concerns. Uh, and indeed, my work has as well. However, if you look at survivorship issues this way, it's a little bit like if you went to a person who had breast cancer surgery and said, we're trying to decide whether mastectomy is better than a lumpectomy, and we're going to make a decision based on whether it's more comfortable or um, aesthetically more appearing, appealing. Surely the patients would say, but I want to know what impact it has on how long I live, 
and whether I'll end up being cancer free. And so it is that with survivorship that there are other considerations than that what the patients might identify themselves. And those considerations might be found in data. If you were to approach cancer survivorship as we approach cancer itself, we would want to know what co commonly is described as the quadruple bottom line or quadruple quality outcome, which includes patient's experience, how you feel, your, your quality of life, as well as population health, survival, mortality, morbidity, cost of care. And also the fourth one is actually well-being of the healthcare team. So the goal of good survivorship care would involve reducing mortality and morbidity, improving care experience and reducing cost, cost of care. Now, when you look at that, uh, it occurred to me that in the study of cancer survivorship, until recently, we knew very little about mortality after cancer that was not cancer specific. So it really begs the question of what it is that people with cancer die of if they don't die of cancer. One of the first studies that answered this question was a study from Tasmania conducted together by uh, epidemiologists as well as cardiologists. And they looked at the data from cancer registries and looked at uh, causes of death of people who did not survive cancer. And what they found was that for both men and women um, after cancer diagnosis, if you did not die of cancer, the most common cause of death was cardiovascular disease as depicted here in red. Now that's probably not that surprising. Cardiovascular disease is common. And in fact, cardiovascular risk factors are common as well. And there is already very good data from breast cancer in particular, but also other cancers that says that likelihood of problems relating to cardiovascular disease are greater if you have more baseline risk factors for cardiovascular disease as shown here. And that applies to breast cancer that is early stage cancer as well as advanced cancer. So more risk factors, more morbidity. There's also more costs of healthcare. The more cardiovascular risk factors you have, the more hospital admissions you might have. And that includes cancer and non-cancer hospital admissions as well as emergency room visits. These are data from United States, from Dawn Hirschman, but very similar figures could be found in Australia. So we know that there is a greater significant impact of cardiovascular disease on mortality, morbidity, and on at cost of care and admissions to hospital. So much so that this paper from United States from about 10 years ago showed that if you look at patients who are long-term cancer survivors of breast cancer, in this case, postmenopausal patients, the likelihood of long-term death from cardiovascular disease shown here in the top dotted line begins to exceed the likelihood of dying of breast cancer at about 10 years follow-up. Now that is important because people do not want to die and they would want to stay alive and free of cancer as well as free of other conditions that cause um, mortality. So preventing death is important. Now one would argue that cardiovascular disease is common and cardiovascular mortality is common. This is the situation where two conditions, breast cancer that's very common with excellent healthcare outcomes, coincides with cardiovascular disease, which is also very common in Australia. So the point is, and something that I've heard from cardiologists many, many times, um, the comment that I would hear is, that's not very exciting. You would expect lots of cardiovascular disease because it's a very common condition. So the issue is, how does that compare to the normal population? Well, of late, our group has found some answers to that very question. So what we wanted to do is find the answer to the question of what is it that cancer survivors die of when eventually they die? So in South Australia, we looked at the data from the cancer registry, and we've identified individuals who survived at least five years after cancer diagnosis. So we said these are the people who would not die of acute toxicity of treatment or acute mortality from cancer. If you've lived for five years after diagnosis, you have a very good chance of being a cancer survivor. 
So for those cancer survivors, when they eventually die, what is it that they die of? And we can calculate mortality rates, which is, which is the rates of death for particular age group and particular gender within population. And we can calculate those mortality rates and compare them to what are the expected figures for South Australian population, again, again according to age group and gender for South Australia. So we looked at those individuals and we followed them up for quite a long time. Our average or median survival, median follow-up time was about 17 years. And we looked at the causes of death. So causes that included cancer as well as non-cancer. And this is what we found. We had over 30,000 individuals with cancer, very small proportion of them children. Majority of them were like a typical population of South Australia, mostly Caucasian, about half were male. At diagnosis, their, median, their mean age was about 60 years and mean age at death was about 80 years, followed up for median period of 17 years and good representation of all cancer types with about 20% of breast cancer. And we had just over 17% of deaths. And of those, just under half were attributed to cancer and 55% were attributed to non-cancer. And of those, the most common was ischemic heart disease. For women, the most common cause of death was breast cancer with ischemic heart disease uh, following straight after. And for men, the most common cause was ischemic heart disease. The important findings are summarized here. And I know that this is a pretty busy slide, but I'll take you through it very, very step by step. You would notice that you have two panels. There is a blue one and a pink one. The blue one looks at survival rates for uh, overall causes of death. And um, the pink one looks at cardiovascular mortality. And in circle, you see standardized mortality rate if it's greater than one, it means it's higher than general population. And you would see that it's 24% higher for overall mortality and 42% higher for cardiovascular disease. And that applies to all age groups, both for overall and cardiovascular mortality. Breast cancer is summarized here with 30% increased mortality for overall mortal mortality and 25% increased mortality for cardiovascular mortality not as high as for other cancers, but still higher than the general population. We've also looked at this question in a different way. We looked at likelihood of developing comorbidities and we used a way of looking at drug prescriptions after cancer and uh, used drugs as a surrogate for comorbid conditions. Um, and here you would notice that we looked at a variety of chronic conditions uh, and asked the question of whether what is the likelihood of people followed up over time developing a particular condition? And you would notice that for cardiovascular disease, over time, uh, both people with cancer and people without cancer were likely to develop cardiovascular condition, but the likelihood of developing it was greater for people who had cancer than those who did not have cancer. So there is something that occurs that predisposes to development of cardiovascular disease that is not just the background presence of the disease of the population. What are the possibilities? You already know that there is a lot of cancer drugs that can predispose to cardiovascular disease and many of those drugs that are used in treatment of breast cancer but also other cancers are particular offenders including anthracyclines, taxanes, hormonal therapy, HER2 directed therapy, some of the newer CDK46 inhibitors, for example, immunotherapy and radiation therapy. So not surprisingly, most of the cancer treatments uh, lead to some form of predisposition. But interestingly, in the diagram, the busy diagram that I presented to you, the risk of cardiovascular disease was increased even for people who had no cancer treatment other than surgery, for example, people with skin cancers. So I don't think it's the drug effect alone that is an important factor. There are other possibilities. And this diagram provides a bit of an insight here. This is the figure that looks at factors associated with developing cardiovascular disease and breast, breast cancer. So cardiovascular disease in the first column and breast cancer in the second column. 
And in green, you have arrows that show reduction of risk. In red, arrows that show increase in risk and different lifestyle factors um, on the left. Now, the important point is that for majority of risk factors, the pattern of risk is the same. So for example, healthy diet leads to reduced risk of both cardiovascular disease and breast cancer. And smoking is detrimental to both. So that's easy. Physical activity is beneficial. Now, the trick is when it comes to alcohol, it seems to be good for cardiovascular disease, not so good for breast cancer, and early menopause, which is the, the mainstay of hormonal treatment for breast cancer, is beneficial in terms of breast cancer and potentially detrimental in terms of cardiovascular disease. So we have some challenges here of how to balance risks and benefits for at least some of those risk factors. But the table really highlights the fact that in addition to the drug effect, the lifestyle effects are very important and potentially very modifiable. So when you're thinking about recommending exercise to cancer survivors, it is not just because it improves your well-being, improves your fitness, reduces your body, improves your body composition, so ultimately improves outcomes for breast cancer, but reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease. If this was a drug, everybody would be prescribing it. But of course, patients often don't know that those are the risk factors. And by the time we, they finish their cancer treatment, they may not have a lot of motivation with regards to improving their uh, lifestyle. And that is also an important factor that might drive some of the mechanisms of why it is that the risk of cardiovascular disease is greater after cancer. So now onto the question of what can we do about it? Now that we're beginning to understand what is the problem, how can we provide a solution? When I was a medical oncology trainee, which was quite a long time ago, the way it worked was a little bit like this. You find a person who are receiving anthracyclines, doxorubicin in this case, you send them to have an echocardiogram of their heart. And if the echo shows good ejection fraction, you give them doxorubicin and you congratulate yourself on the job well done. It was actually a very, very simple process. And if you think that things have changed a lot, it is worth reflecting on the fact that the majority of guidelines of how to manage cardiac disease after cancer focus on exactly that, on measuring of echocardiograms, on checking uh, cardiac function through uh, gated blood pool scans, and on trying to pick appropriate drugs. So there's still a focus on the drug and the heart function as a result. And there is much less focus on other risk factors. And yet, if we look at what happens in the clinic, there is a slightly different picture. These are the results of the study, small study that our group had conducted when we went to the waiting room of the breast cancer clinic and we asked women with uh, breast cancer ab about their lifestyle risk factors and also their interest in changing their lifestyle um, with regards to the risk of cardiovascular disease. And you would see that about one in five had high blood pressure, one in 10 had high cholesterol, one in 10 were smokers, Majority were taking regular alcohol, a quarter were inactive, 65% were overweight or obese, and about a third had experienced significant distress. And perhaps because of that distress, at that time, they were quite reluctant to change their lifestyle. So this is not just that knowing something implies that you could do something about it. But this slide really highlights that it is not just the drug and ejection fraction, <clears throat> It is also the patient's risk factors that need to be addressed somehow. But how do we address them if the patient is busy, overwhelmed with multiple appointments, their access to health services like specialized services or GP practices might be limited? I think that we're still struggling with trying to find a healthcare model that improves outcomes for patients in a user-friendly way. And that leads me to the study that we have designed and are currently conducting with the support from National Breast Cancer Foundation. And we call it the Heart in Breast Cancer Study, reducing the burden of cardiovascular disease in breast cancer patients and survivors. 
And our study has three parts. First, we started talking to stakeholders, patients, cardiologists, oncologists, GPs, about what they understand about cardiovascular disease after cancer, what is their level of awareness, what do they understand what the condition is, what do they see is the patient's focus on cardiovascular disease, and, and what they would require done. And what we found in those qualitative interviews was that there was really very little awareness of what the disease involves and what could be done about it or what should be done about it. Patients felt that their primary focus was and should be on cancer and often didn't realize that there were other needs. And uniformly, stakeholders felt that there was really a need to integrate cardiovascular care with cancer care and with primary care in such a way that it is seamless. So rather than adding yet ad additional level of appointments, we need to build it into the overall flow of care for people with cancer, in particular during that acute phase of cancer treatment. So that was the very first part of our work. And the second part was we looked at the evidence. So we went into the literature and we looked at what is the evidence for interventions for patients with cancer with regards to improving cardiovascular health. And what we have learned that altogether we found 14 systematic reviews and meta-analyses that looked at the interventions. And to our surprise, the level of evidence available was actually quite limited. There were data on some interventions, inter for example, cardioprotectants in pediatric population, but mostly not in adult population, and specific aspects of testing for cardiac function, like echocardiograms or biomarkers. Um, and there was some data on the benefits of exercise, but there was very little data on how to implement this, uh, this evidence into clinical practice. And what I mean by that of who should be doing the work, at what time, how should it be funded? How, when should it be started? So that brings me to the third level of our research, and that is a nurse-led intervention. We felt that we really needed to put this care in the middle of cancer care because patients identified their cardiovascular needs early during the acute phase of treatment. And we wanted to put a nurse coordinator with the cardiovascular expertise that would connect with the patient and identify the risks and really connect all the different providers together to deliver appropriate care plan for the patient. So this is a small pragmatic study. So far we've enrolled 34 patients and in general patients find this intervention very acceptable and uh, they sort of adhering to the process of care plan development and assessment, but our data on efficacy has not yet been collected. What the nurse does is she does the initial screening and risk uh, assessment for cardiovascular disease and identifies risks from high, intermediate, and low. And if the patient has high risk of problems, she might refer them to a specialist. Other patients would be connected with the oncology providers and the primary care providers. We develop a care plan that tells the patients of what to do, how to reduce their risk, and how to connect it with the overall care. In the process of the uh, intervention development, we've learned that there was actually no specific resources for patients for cardiovascular health in Australia that we could provide, with, uh, provide them. So we've developed some specific resources that we're giving to patients at the moment. Most of them are sort of paper-based, but we're hoping that we can develop online resources as well. So this study is currently ongoing, but I hope that next year we will be able to share the efficacy results with you. So just to finish off, a couple of other things. As I think about those issues of cardiovascular disease after cancer, I recognize that very often this is actually a very scary issue because people tend to think that this is just a burden of additional problem that hasn't been addressed. And to some extent, it is a problem that hasn't been addressed. But I also feel that if we understand how cardiovascular disease develops in people with cancer, what are the mechanisms and what are the pathways that lead to its development, we can actually identify something about cancer as well. And potentially, we can develop interventions that potentially target both.
And even in the health system delivery, when the patient is seen by their general practitioner or oncologist, whenever you're checking for breast cancer, you should be checking for cardiovascular disease at the same time. So this is something that I'm aspiring to, and I hope that this will be the work that we could progress further. And just to give you some examples of why or how this could work, these are the couple of studies that literally came up late last year and were really quite thought provo provoking. This is the result of a molecular sort of laboratory study in mice where mice with growing tissue of breast cancer were artificially exposed to a myocardial infarction or a heart attack where the coronary blood vessel in the mouse would be tied over. And what they found was that the stress of myocardial infarction resulted in production of, of substances in the body that actually led to the accelerated growth of the breast tumor, suggesting that there is some way that cardiovascular disease and cancer communicate, which really is something that we should explore more and harness. Now, another example is a more clinical data from this study um, well-known uh, in terms of treatment, hormonal treatment of breast cancer, where patients on the study were uh, assessed with regards to whether they were receiving cholesterol-lowering medications. And what was found was that those that were receiving cholesterol-lowering medications were having better breast cancer outcomes. You could argue that if you lower cholesterol, you get better cardiovascular disease outcomes, but we do not have a clear understanding of why it is that the breast cancer outcomes uh, reduced uh, likelihood of recurrence would be improved, but indeed that's what was observed. So I think that we do have some suggestions that there are common pathways that might allow us to target one disease and obtain a benefit for that disease and another disease as well. So I think this is an area that is really at its infancy, but this is where there is a lot of very exciting possibilities that might give us some tools of improving treatment of breast cancer, as well as presenting the double jeopardy of cardiovascular disease as well. So to finish off, my take home messages. Firstly, the more we learn about cancer, the more we realize that it does not occur in isolation. And we really need to start recognizing other needs, but also other comorbid conditions. Patients with cancer have cardiovascular disease, they have diabetes, they have mental health issues. And I think for each of those, there are important findings that we need to address that would allow us to improve outcomes for people affected by cancer, rather than just for the disease itself. Secondly, general health and risk factor modification is important. So if there's one thing that you could take from this presentation today, it is lifestyle, physical activity, healthy diet, mental health, sleep. These are very important interventions that you could put in place into action today, not even tomorrow. And they have tremendous impact on well-being, but also other healthcare outcomes, both for cancer and other diseases. And lastly, survivorship research is not just about psychosocial care. There is also need for preclinical laboratory research that looks at common mechanisms and pathways because they might be a key to better outcomes for comorbid conditions, but also for cancer. So I think those researchers in cancer survivorship need to get into the lab or partner with laboratory researchers to answer some of those questions. And lastly, none of this would be possible without generous support of donors and generous support of organizations like NBCF. And in particular, during the COVID pandemic, these are the organizations that kept the researchers afloat and supported at the time where many other research opportunities disappeared literally overnight. So I hope that I can give you a sense of some amazing possibilities and really bright future. Um, and that in, the, in a year or two to come, I will be able to share with you some of the more uh, exciting findings of the research. So thank you for your attention. These are my contact details. If you wish to reach out to me and ask questions, 
that we do not cover tonight, please drop me a line. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Koswara, for your insightful presentation uh, tonight about your research in cardiovascular health and for those experiencing breast cancer. And for all, all the hard work that you are doing on this exciting National Breast Cancer Foundation project. We will now go to a few brief question and answers, and we've collect, collated the most popular questions answered on, asked on reg registration. Firstly, Professor Koswara, what are the challenges you think you'll face when carrying out this project? I think that uh, I can uh, identify two broad challenges. One is that we, even for cardiovascular disease, we need to recognize that any strategies for care need to be embedded into the overall care. And patients with cancer are already busy. They have other priorities. They often work. They have families. We cannot just add care on top of the existing care. If you think about a person diagnosed with breast cancer today, that person is likely to have a surgeon, a medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, GP, a breast care nurse, and potentially if they have other health conditions, they might have an endocrinologist or a psychologist or other healthcare providers. They're already pretty busy. So one of the challenges is we cannot solve the problem by just adding something on top and expect that the person can just seamlessly take that on board. We have to figure out a way of integrating care in such a way that we do not add to the burden. The other challenge is reaching people varies depending to this on, on their circumstances. So if you live in a rural area, if you do not speak English, uh, it might be harder for you to access those services. So I think we need to find clever ways of reaching people who have the needs. So I think that those are the sort of the more broader uh, priorities. I think the challenges that we have experienced was the challenges of opening the study in the middle of the pandemic, but I suspect that most of your listeners already know about what those challenges could be given their own personal experiences of healthcare. Thank you, it's good to know. Um, the second question is, and I think you've already touched on a few of these issues, for those that have already been through treatment for breast cancer and have subsequently developed cardiovascular issues, is there anything that they can do to prevent further damage? Probably the very first thing to do is to have a good conversation with the GP. Um, most people in most sort of uh, adults, I think after the age of uh, 40 in Australia would be certainly in a, with the history of breast cancer would be eligible to have a very rapid cardiovascular risk assessment by the GP that would identify risk factors and prompt the discussion about how to modify those risk factors. For overwhelming majority of people, risk factor modification involves not smoking, physical activity, um, maintaining healthy weight and healthy diet. For some people, uh, cardiovascular medications might be appropriate uh, for use. And some in, there are specialized cardiologists around Australia who can provide expertise of how to use those medications. Certainly, if there was one thing with regards to medications that one could do, it is main, making sure that the blood pressure is well controlled. So checking your blood pressure, getting a checkup of your GP, making sure that you undertake physical activity. Those are the things that you could do today and they will pay you back handsomely for a very little outlay. It's great to know. Thank you again. The, the final question, which I think is a very important question is, how can we incorporate cardio health into standard oncology treatment and the management um, and include it in optimal care? So, um... I think we're already doing it, which is incredibly exciting as the awareness of those issues is increasing. And I think the awareness really started emer emerging around two years ago. We have seen the development of some uh, interest groups in cardiovascular disease and cancer. 
We have just form of a collaborative group between oncology professional society and cardiology professional society. The Heart Foundation is interested in um, developing resources for patients and healthcare providers. And uh, there are some exciting collaborations in terms of data collection nationally. So I think that there is interest in research that provides more data, more resources for patients and more work on novel developments, novel models of care. So I think that this is just taking off. Um, and I think that probably in a year or two, you would find that uh, there will be access to dedicated cardio-oncology expertise in every state in Australia, uh, given the speed of how this work is growing. Thank you, Professor Kozlara. Um, it leads me to um, conclude the webinar tonight. As members of the National Breast Cancer Foundation community, I'd like to thank you all for your ongoing support of the National Breast Cancer Foundation and for joining us here tonight. We hope that you found this webinar interesting and Professor Koswara's project insightful. The webinar has been recorded and will be emailed out to you later this week. I'd Finally, I'd like to thank again, Professor Koswara and her team for her, their amazing work um, that they do and for sharing this with us today. Thank you.